Hi, and welcome. I'm Sue Perlgut. I'm the co-founder of It's All Right to Be Woman Theater. And I'm Dr. Jessica Del Vecchio, Assistant Professor of Theater at James Madison University in Virginia. Welcome to the first of our three-part panel series on feminist theater, past and present. Six months ago, I reached out to Jessica with an idea for a panel that would bring together feminist artists to talk about their work. As Jessica and I brainstormed artists to invite, one panel morphed into three. We enlisted the help of Dr. Sarah Warner, who connected us with the extraordinary E. Cornell to bring our vision to life. We hope that the conversations engendered in these panels will give audiences a sense of the trajectory of feminist theater in the U.S. over the past several decades. Our aim is to celebrate the artists of the past and to inspire per feminist performance of the future. So we want to thank the Performing and Media Arts Department at Cornell University, James Madison University, and Close to Home Productions for their support. And now, I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful, incredible Dr. Sarah Warner, Associate Professor of Performing and Media Arts and the current director of the LGBT Studies Program at Cornell University. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to moderate this panel and deeply grateful to Jessica and Sue for um, dreaming this up and inviting me to be part of it. Before we go further, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement. Uh, Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayukono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayukono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayukono people past and present to these lands and waters. And we also acknowledge the land on which our panelists are speaking from and our audiences as well. This series um, is part of our year long celebration marking the 30th anniversary of LGBT studies and the 50th anniversary of feminist gender and sexuality studies, originally called women's studies. Um, and it's a delightful history to me to know that Tony Award and Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Paul Vogel was part of that early cohort of women's studies here at Cornell. The title of this panel, The Personal is Still Political, refers to an essay by second wave feminist Carol Hainish, a member of both New York Radical Women and Red Stockings. Now, Hainish didn't invent this phrase. It was the product of a collective political imagination that emerged from consciousness raising groups. One of the first things we discover in this group, writes Hainish in this essay, is that personal problems are political problems. There are no personal solutions at this time. There's only collective action for collective solutions. Women's theater performance by, about, and for women developed with and from the women's liberation movement. And it offers a paradigmatic example of collective action for collective solutions. We're fortunate to have some pioneering voices from this historical moment with us tonight. And I'll briefly sketch their bios here in the interest of time and encourage everyone in the audience to go to the registration page and our archival website curated by the wonderful Sue Pearlgut um, for more information about our guests. So in alphabetical order, we have Bobby Osbell, co-founder and co-artistic director of Caravan Theater from Cambridge, Massachusetts. It operated from 1963 to 1976. And Caravan is best known for a work titled How to Make a Woman. Uh, and this theater troupe was also hailed by Rosemary Kerb as the first play, oh, sorry, the How to Make a Woman was hailed as the first play of the women's liberation movement. Martha Bozing, founder and artistic director of Minneapolis based at the foot of the mountain theater ran from 1974 to 1991. And when this troupe shutters, shuttered, they were the longest running feminist theater company uh, in the United States. That's a title now held by Spider Woman Theater. Chief among at the foot of the mountains influential works are a story of a mother raped so. and ashes to ashes we all mm -hmm. fall. Next, Sue Pearlgut, 
who we've already met, the uh, co-curator of this series and the co-founder of It's All Right to Be a Woman Theater, which ran in from 1970 to 1976 in New York with lots of tours. Um, she's also the producer of a fabulous new documentary about uh, the troupe, and I urge you all to watch it. Last but certainly not least, Sandra Siegel and Roberta Sklar, co-founders and artistic co-directors of Women's Experimental Theater, which ran from 1976 to 1986. Women's Experimental Theater is best known for their Daughter Cycle Trilogy and Feast or Famine, and this production was part of another triptych titled Women's Body and Other Natural Resources. Well, Women's Experimental Theater developed much of their work at Women's Inter Art Center in New York City. We're going to be sharing some images and video with the audience tonight. And at any time, you are welcome to put a question in the chat. So if something pops into your mind, don't lose it. Put it in the chat, and we'll have a Q&A session uh, at the end of our conversation. So without further ado, I'll pose the first question, and um, I'll ask Bobby if she would kindly start the responses for us. How did you come to feminist theater? And what did this term mean to you in the 1960s? What was it like to make explicitly feminist performance at this moment in history? You have to take your mute off, Bobby. Thank you. Hi, okay. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of sun coming here at these. Unlike most feminist theaters, Caravan started before, in 1963 actually, as a part of the experimental theater movement that was going on. And then um, <clears throat> in around 1966, I went to um, our pretzel and beer meeting that we had to get people planning for next year. And I said, I want to do a play about what it's like to be a woman. So this is 1966. Mm -hmm. And all the women said, nam, 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 nam. And one of the men said, oh, I love my grandma and I love my mother. Let's do a play about women. So <laughs> that's what happened. And we went into rehearsal, which is improvisation. And we improvised for months. And um, Stan Edelson is the co-founder with me. And he went off after all these and wrote a script that became How to Make a Woman. Mm. And that's, so we began that in 67, performing at um, a coffee house in Cambridge. So um, then one day we, w we found a, a home at a church and we performed, we're gonna ready to perform there when we performed at the um, coffee house, people clapped and went home. They didn't get it. I found out later interviewing people. But then one day Joe came into the theater and said, female liberation was just born, born at the 68 convention. And that's how we heard about it. So I ran off to meet somebody who was one of the early members of Female Liberation. And uh, we opened our play, which we had planned to do. Then people came and understood. I mean, it's interesting that what, what that was about. So that was how we started. And I always had a deep, deep, deep passion that I didn't want a life like my mother's. And I read when it came out, Simone de Beauvoir's book, The Second Sex, and I gathered people and said, let's read this. And it was always burning inside of me. So I was very happy <laughs> and shocked that female liberation put a real different perspective on it. And that's how we began. Thank you. Um, Martha, would you like to talk about your theater yeah. trip now? Well, I, I, I just sort of want to begin by saying that we were absolutely riding the wave of, of the second women's movement. I mean, there's no question but what we wouldn't have 
been born you know, that huge movement mm -hmm. of women across the nation. And part of that movement was that anywhere between 130 and 175 women's theaters across the country sprang up like mushrooms in the spring rain. I mean, they just, there they were. No precedent, no understanding of how that happened, but there they all were. And they ran the gamut from professional theater women who are professional artists and and um, Judy Garland there's a barn let's put a bar, let's put a play up and it, it but it, it was it was just very exciting that um, but the, but at foot of the mountain like many other theaters and especially those represented here especially uh, Roberta and Sandra I believe um, in a, in a way we came together because we were just fed up with the situation there were no women playwrights being done. There were no great roles for women. There were no, um, you know, it was just, there were two women directors at major regional theaters, Nina Fitchhannel and um, Nina Vance. And that was kind of it. And now there are just hundreds of regional theaters that are um, indeed um, run by women. Um, and so we began to ask ourselves, there was a group of us that sort of got together and were asking ourselves, well, what would it be like, I wonder, if women got together and created a theater and were the directors and the writers and the producers and the artists, and what would that look like? And that's how we began. We began by meeting together and, and asking that question together. What we all had in common with just about every single feminist theater across the country was that we we were running, we were doing plays to create action. We mm -hmm. wanted people to be literally moved enough by our work to go out and do something about the issues that we were raising. And that was very exciting. So in a sense, yes, the personal is political. We just, we, we raised our, our whole roots on that. that. That was how we began and how we continued was to believe that whatever was really personal with us, how we were missing women in the theater, for example, and, and feeling left out and feeling silenced, it was a political issue. It was not a personal issue. And that's, I mean, Sarah was mentioning this, that that was the collective, if you will, um, underpinnings of all our feminist theaters. And that's how we also uh, began. And um, I came out of the um, Firehouse Theater, which was an offshoot of the Open Theater in New York and um, in, Minneapolis, in Minneapolis. And, you know, a lot of the aesthetics we were following, a lot of it, but we'll talk about this later when we get to how we work. But, you know, came out of that experimental theater. So many, many, many of us were experimental theater people. We were not doing normal male, if you will, theater. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 let me let me just stop there because I think we're coming to some very important questions up a little later and uh, turn out turn the work over to who Sarah, who's next? Oh, Roberta and Sandra. Who? <laughs> Go for it. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, is it us? Okay. Well, <clears throat> how we came to to uh, create our theater is different for each Sandra and I. And for Claire Koss, who isn't with us tonight, but the three of us were the founders of the Women's Experimental Theater. Um, Claire uh, was a playwright and a poet and a psychotherapist. And um, I'll let Sandra speak for herself. Uh, I was coming from the uh, experimental theater, and I'd just like to pick up on what um, uh, Martha just said, which is that um, I worked with the open theater, and it was a it was a, a counterculture theater created by um, men and women, and men were, I think it was Cindy Rosenthal who said it was an unusual situation, but not unusual for the collectives, that it was a leaderless organization with a very strong leader. The leader being a male who took credit for all of the work that went on. So um, I was thrilled to be working in that theater 
until I came to feel that it didn't represent me. We were looking at subjugation, at domination, at um, the ways in which the human psyche is, is suppressed by culture, but not looking at women. And I, um, I was certainly dissatisfied, and I, I started working at, uh, I continued working with the Open Theater, but I started teaching at Bard College and with a group of about 20 female students um, who got to be in what was called the women's unit. Um, lucky for me, the head of the department felt there were too many women in the department, and so he allowed me to have a class that was exclusively for women. It, it rectified what he called the imbalance. Um, so I got to, for, for a few years, to, to work with um, about uh, 15 female students, basically doing, uh, using uh, improvisational exercises to explore stories and so forth. But at a, at a key point, I saw a performance of It's All Right to Be Women. Grassroots didn't look like, it looked like a community theater um, with costumes that were made by mom. Um, but it, it moved me. I understood that the content was my content. And it, that the content I had been working on at the Open Theater and other theaters, I was very involved with Off-Off Broadway and with Semi and Professional Theater in New York, that the content was irrelevant that I was perpetuating and expending all of my um, creative energy on the male tradition and the male voice and the male message. And I really did not want to continue doing that. Luckily for me, Sandra Siegel came along. I'm going to turn it over to her. Um, I came out of a different... It came at it a different way, I think. I was a housewife, a married housewife in New Jersey in the suburbs. Um, not very happy at it. And thinking about all that was going on in the world. And I, in a book bookstore, I came across Robin Morgan's Sisterhood is Powerful. And I was just leaping through it, leaping through it, leaping through it. Click, 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 click. And I thought, hmm. I have to get out of here. <laughs> I moved back to New York City where I had lived before. I left my husband. I moved back to New York City. I joined a consciousness raising group and I founded with others a grassroots theater to explore ourselves as women. Um, and at some point I saw the open theater and I thought, oh, I like that. <laughs> I like what I'm seeing. The actors are so present. It's so different. It's so different from anything I've seen. And I want to perform. I don't want to be someone else's muse. Finally in my life, I want to be the artist. And I think I have something to say. And I need to find the right way to say it. And I found that there weren't too many available right ways to say it. And we had to turn our attention once we formed our theater to excavating not only the content of our lives, but coming up with forms that express that content, ways to express that content. And what Sandra left out was that um, the, she called me, uh, having oh, right. been at the, at the open theater, the grassroots organization that she was a part of was looking for a teacher and asked me if I could recommend someone. And I said, yes, myself, because it was an opportunity to work with women who were just focused on wanting to figure out a way of expressing who they were. And once we began working together, that, that particular setting did not really satisfy our, our, our particular needs. Together with Claire, we founded the Women's Experimental Theater, which uh, had more of a, a level of um, combining uh, 
the value of theater methods, uh, aesthetics, techniques with the questions we were researching. And, the que you know, and so the combination of the desire to focus on the lived experience of women and the meaning of it and to focus it in as, as crystal clear a theatrical way as possible led us to founding the Women's Experimental Theater. I'd like to add one additional thing, which is that we were also very, we were completely committed to performance. Mm -hmm. That without the audience, it's not theater. And we were not going to spend our time simply on process and self-discovery. That we wanted to find a way to mm -hmm. speak directly to other women about these things we were questioning together. So performance became and Sue, how does that relate to your experience? And well, you know, it's so it's so similar. Um, I was in a street theater group called Burning City Theater. You know, doing political street theater. I saw the open theater. I loved it. I thought this is the way I. This is theater. This is the way one should be moving. This is the way one should be telling a story. I, I have to admit. Roberta, half the time I didn't understand anything that was going on, but it didn't matter because the movement, um, the way people were working together, it was gorgeous. So Burning City Theater, we did improvisation. It was men and women. We performed in the streets. We performed in the park. We went off and lived together on a commune in New Hampshire. Uh, and, and, um, and then we were dysfunctional. So um, what happened was that we were invited to perform at a festival of underground theater in Toronto. And the group could not function. So the women, so the women said, okay, we're going to go off and we're going to work on our own. So we, we went off to a barn on the property. And we started to work and nothing much was happening. Somebody, and I wish I knew who, came up with the brilliant idea of doing stories from our lives. So I think there were seven of us, um, and each told a story from a different age. Mine was when I was 14, and then we went up. Um, and so that was, for me, the first all-women's theater telling stories from our lives. We went to the Festival of Underground Theater in Toronto in the summer of 1970. They thought, Oh my God, women performing, we're going to be taking off our bras and throwing them on the stage. And, um, and we did this performance and blew everybody away, including ourselves. And as I was performing, I said, oh, this is it. This is what I want to be doing with my life. This is, I had never felt so good and so powerful and so right. So I'm like, okay, women, let's, you know, okay, so it's not working with the men. Let's just go off and do our own thing. Nope, nope, they were, they were all involved. So um, I, we did perform in New York City, and I had some friends, and after they saw the Burning City Theater performance, I called up a few friends and said, gee, I really want to form a women's theater troupe. And my good friend, Lynn Laredo, who unfortunately has, has died, um, said she was a go-getter. She said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And we started to work at Alternate U, which was a Marxist university um, on the lower west side of New York. And we started to have some workshops. And one day there were 10 of us in the room. And I said, that's it. We're done having workshops. We are now forming a theater. This is our theater. And then I invited one other friend to join in, my friend Roberta. Um, I pulled her in. And this is not this Roberta, different Roberta. And um, we formed the troupe. You know, we were collective. This was the early 70s. We didn't have a leader. We didn't have a director. You know, in, in retrospect, it would have been nice um, to have somebody stand back. But, but it was okay. It really, we told stories from our lives. We... We we had no idea we would go to we'd have a performance and 500 women would show up sitting on the floor of a church, and there were all these aha moments. Sandra, people left their husbands. People came out. Um, you know, Roberta Sawson changed the way she did theater. You know, it, it's like and um, and we had no idea we were going to have that kind of impact because in, for, I can talk for myself. I can't talk for the other 10 women. I can say for me, it was about me. 
You know, I mean, I knew, I knew I needed to do this, but I didn't know the impact it was going to have on the women in the audience. And we had men in the audience too, who had impact, but it was, it was, it was an amazing experience. And, um, uh, you know, I keep trying to recreate it, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so that's 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 kind of how we formed uh, street theater and um, improvisational theater, um, and we, you know, many of us, most of us, I'd say most of us had, did not have theater experience, but we had come out of consciousness raising groups, so we knew how to talk about ourselves. We went off to a, tr- a retreat at a monastery in upstate New York and talked about our lives, and from there we started to create plays. Great. Um, I wish I had been there. Um, uh, So let's talk a little bit more about content. So a lot of you did stories from your lives for the troops. What form did those stories take? What were those stories about? Were there topics that you gravitated toward? Were there topics that you purposely ignored? Were there things that you didn't talk about until later because they weren't on your radar? Uh, Martha, would you like to start this for us? Well, yeah, I just wanted to just say one thing. Roberta mentioned this that uh, about the content. And, and it's true that all through the 60s, I was very in touch with some of the leading um, experimental theaters, like the Open Theater Performance Group, and, <coughs> and was also just falling in love with the work, um, as all of you have mentioned. But it, when we got together, we said, okay, it'll be very interesting to explore the question of will women create a whole different form of theater? And the more we worked and the more we drew on our experiences from the 60s, which were very rich, as Roberta was saying about the open theater and stuff, I mean, we, we drew on those experiences we had had acting with them and, for, and doing work with them over the years, the more we realized that we weren't really changing the form to any great extent. We were changing the content. There were no plays around that were talking about women. And, and I mean, now people would be like Megan Terry, and I mean, there were a lot of people who were really beginning to work with this problem of the invisibility and the silence around women and their lives and their activities and their interests. And then the more we did that, the more we realized that that was what we would that was the subject we were talking about and for and by women and it just plain didn't it wasn't around it didn't it really exist very much before that so one of the one of the are we on to the second question here <laughs> the women uh, you know the feminine politics you want to talk about your uh like raped and yeah, I want to talk a little about some of our shows that we did. Uh, we would usually choose a, this is the show called Rape, A Woman's Look at Bertolt Brecht's The Exception and the Rule. Um, we were, we would choose the topic. And we chose the topic of rape. And we read everything about it and everything. I mean, there were a lot of books coming out about it at the time. And um, and we read all those books and we began to look. And we began by saying, okay, we're all going to share our rape stories. Well, it was very interesting because most everybody said, I was never raped. I'm one of the lucky ones. And by the end, before we opened the show, we realized that each one of us had a rape story. And that was a startling awareness. I mean, and like, for example, that rape wasn't just of the body. Sometimes it was of the mind. It was of our lives in one way or another. People were raping us of our information, of our knowledge. I was a writer in college, and I had a creative writing teacher who has subsequently become rather famous. Writer. And he um, liked my work and encouraged me and kept saying, you must keep writing. I was writing poetry at the time. Keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. And at the end of the year, he saw his students. I went into his office to see him, and he said, you're really an interesting writer. You're a good writer. But unfortunately, you'll never be a great writer because women have little minds. Oh, my God. They simply do not write great pieces of literature. I mean, I don't know what happened to Emily Dickinson and Virginia Woolf in that conversation, but they were gone. Um, but um, 
And I, let me tell you, I was, I loved this writer. I was sort of adored him and I adored his class. And I was crushed. I didn't write again for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. He successfully raped my mind. And so we put this play on uh, by Bertolt Brecht about a little coolie who is by the judge blamed for the, um, the, the death of the master. And, um, and, and because he held up a, he, they were traveling and he held up a little uh, canteen, a little cup with a little water. And he said, would you like some water? And the, the guy thought that his, his master thought that he would, had a rock in his hand. So he killed the coolie. Anyway, we, we said, that's what, that's what happens. The women get blamed, right? It's the woman's fault. You get raped, it's your problem. You, you set it up. And so we, we, what we did is we interrupted this play with stories of rape. Um, and and um, we, pa we papered the walls of the theater we were working in with a little black box at a church. And we um, papered them with stories of people who had been raped, women who had been raped, abused. Anything you saw as a kind of rape, we just pasted them all over our walls. And then they, and they interrupted. Well, it was fascinating. I mean, people were really, ooh, um, they loved they loved that play. That was always wonderful. Um, but um, we went to give it at a conference, at a women's conference, and it was in Minneapolis. And we realized that every just about everybody in the audience had already seen this play at least once, maybe twice. So we had to do something different. So we decided that anybody in the audience could at any moment say stop, and we would freeze mid song, mid scene, whatever. We would just freeze in the spot and let them tell. They'd stand up in the audience and tell a rape story. Mm. And then when they sat down, we would just pick up from the play and go on. And this was a amazing experience. The mm. stories that happened, people were silenced. They were terrified. Maybe the woman beside me is going to stand up and say something. Blah! And they, you know, it was a terribly exciting. One day we were at a college and a young man put his hand up and he said, for the first time in my life, I realized I've been a rapist. Oh, and, things, and everybody was, you know, in the audience. And people, it was just so thrilling. I mean, it, it lengthened the play about a 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but aside from that fact, it's a little play, <laughs> but aside from that fact, it was just extraordinary how this affected people. So we kept trying to bring, you know, and that we felt that was like a, you, you asked your question, Sarah, about uh, the feminine, feminist politics in our work, and that felt very much like feminist politics to be doing that. And then we did other plays, uh, like Ashes, Ashes, We All Fall Down, was about the nuclear war, and at the center of the piece was um, a mother who was dying of cancer, and nobody in her family wanted to admit it. They were all in total denial about it. And we used uh, Kubla Ross's stages of uh, dying as the format of the play and brought in all this stuff from Hiroshima and, and the Jewish camps and kept having little scenes of all of these ways in which um, we were asked to fall down. <laughs> as is, as is, we all going to fall down in this one, guys. And then we did a play called um, Las Gringas, which was about um, the... Um, there it is. It was about the U.S. interference with the Sandinistas by creating the Contos and trying to stop the revolution. And in that play, we had women who, who played double roles. They either played a role of an American woman who in some way had been um, invaded and, and treated by conquistadors, if you will. And, and then the, and the other role they played was a Nicaraguan woman who was a, a member of the Sandinistas troops. And we based that on Margaret Randall's wonderful book about Paul Sandino's daughters. And she was there. She came up for rehearsals and for the play. And it was just very thrilling to have her. So then we also did a play called Antigone too. And they just, she just, hi Chris, she just showed that. Maybe bring it back up. And Antigone, too, was about women who committed civil disobedience. And as they walked in the door, every woman that walked in or every person who came to the play, the jail doors would clang shut. And on the, on the tape would be the names of women who had committed civil disobedience in the, Minneapolis, in the Twin Cities area. Over and over again, these 150 women or so. Um, and Antigone was put in jail with uh, about 20 five other women who have committed civil disobedience. 
and they would stop her because she kept saying, I'm so alone in this. I don't know if you remember the Oedipus script, but there's lots of places where she sees herself as very, very alone in this. I'm doing this alone to myself. And they'd come down and say, no, that's not true. There are other women like you who have also committed civil disobedience and also have joined you. And it was very... It, it was a very wonderful celebration of women who can, did that. And then we did a play, I'm rushing through here, but uh, called Junkie. Um, and that was about addiction. And we had women uh, with heroin and uh, smoking and drinking and food and shopping. So we had five women who each had this special addiction, as they called. And... Um, they all told their stories and and uh, in, in that and one thing we did all the time, which again the sort of feminist politics, was we created moments in the play that we would open it up to the audience and um, ask them to join us in one way or another. Like at the end of um, Junkie, we in, they would they were carrying their bags with their stuff in their bags, and at the end. He, they could come forward and put their bag down. Or if the actors didn't feel like doing it that night, they wouldn't. But we would invite audience people to come down and put something in the pile to confront and deal with their addiction. About three years later, I met a gentleman in the um, grocery store. He said, aren't you, didn't you have Martha Bosing? You did something with junkie with addiction? And I said, yeah. And she, he said, you know, I was a policeman. And that night I took my badge down and put it in the pile. And I left the police force, and I became a, a consultant and, and teacher for young people who are dealing with addiction. That just blew me out of the water. <laughs> but the big, I, one of the big things I just wanted to quickly talk about was we talked a lot about economics and how how can you make your economics collective and transparent? Because they felt that the country's split between the rich and the poor was really. Uh, at the bottom of a lot of most of our problems. So um, we gave $125 to everybody every week, everybody, techies, actors, the staff in the office. There were about five, five or six people working in the office. And that was just across the boards. You got $125 a week while you're working. But if you had kids, you got $5 extra for every kid. If you had worked at the theater for more than three years, you got $5 extra. And the big jobs that were um, taking people out of the office and having to work more time, like you know, the artistic director and the managing director, got 10 or $15 more uh, a week. But that's how the salary was built. And we put up a chart on the wall so that everybody who came to the theater could see where their money came from, where it was going. We put up our income, where we got it from grants and donations and ticket sales. And then we had another sign up over the ticket booth itself that said, pay what you can. But here's some suggestions. If you only earn 5000 a year, you pay $5. If you earn 10000 a day, you pay $10. If you earn 20000 a day, you pay $20. Anyway, and then at the end, the highest we went was 40 If you went to, if you, if you earn more than $40 a year, $40,000 a year, then you pay $25. And people would look at that and appreciate they had some kind of guidance because they never were quite sure how much money to give. And we never, if you compared our ticket box office with other little theaters in Minneapolis uh, and St. Paul, we never, ever made less money than they did. And everybody would say, oh, you lose money if you do that. And we went, well, we didn't. So anyway, that felt very political, in a very deeply economic sense. Yeah. So I was I was really glad to be part of that and to do that and to have be working with a company of women who are willing to do that, be that transparent. Thank you, Martha. Um, Sue, do any of those topics resonate uh, with you? Sue, you're muted. I'm, I'm just realized I'm muted. Okay, so um, I hate that. Uh, so um, it's all right to be one of the theater. Took the personal as political to heart. That was our politics. That what was happening in our lives was probably happening in other women's lives. So that was very much our work. Our work was the personal as political, um, and we we discussed a lot of themes. We discussed rape 
And I told my story of when I was sexually abused and raped when I was a kid, and I couldn't go forward with it. We, we, we worked on it for a couple of times, and I said, no, I can't do this. So we just left it. Nobody else talked about rape. Uh, well, that's not totally true, but it wasn't, wasn't the, the focus. Um, we Surprisingly to me now is that I never talked about my illegal abortion. I can't believe that now. It was probably a little too raw then. Uh, now I just tell everybody about it. So, but we didn't, but, and I, we didn't talk about that. Um, what we did do, uh, one of the, the most, when we did a lot of humor. We had a lot of humor. Uh, we did something called crankies, which are paper televisions that are turned and tell stories. We had some funny ones. We had some serious ones. Um, we um, we did a lot of chanting at the beginning. We sat around in a circle and we chanted. We were hippies, so that's what we did. Um, and we sat around and we sang. And um, before each performance, before we actually did the play that we had set, we invited women up to tell their dreams. And we did what was called dream plays, which we borrowed. We borrowed everything. We borrowed our name from a poem. We borrowed dream plays from a, I forgot what theater it was. We just took their dream plays. Um, so uh, we did dream plays, and women would get up and tell their dream, and we would improv, improvise it on the spot. And, in fact, we got very, very good at it. We were, we were quite amazingly good at improvising people's dreams. Um, so that's how we got the audience involved. And then we'd go to our stories. We had, when there was 11 of us, we told stories about, we did clothing vignettes. You know, we did stories about being a cheerleader and, you know, how someone is still a cheerleader as a married woman. She was still being a cheerleader. We did stories about somebody's prince, you know, um, and then after the troop split were <clears throat> what I thought was for um, creative reasons. Other people thought it was gay straight, although the troop stayed a combination of, of gay women and straight women. Um, we then started to work differently after we saw, well, one, one of the plays we did was I'm a woman giving birth to myself. And it was Ellen's story. She was getting off heroin. And then she was on methadone, and she was getting off methadone. And it was this absolutely gorgeous story about addiction, her addiction, and how she was moving out of her addiction and how she got into her addiction. And um, it was so painful and difficult to do that I think we only performed it two or three times because it, it uh, was exhausting for all of us to do that. Um, and then we saw um, Spider Woman Theater. We had been we we would go to other theaters, and we went to Spider Woman Theater. It was, must have been 1972 or 1973, and they had done this absolutely spectacular performance where the sisters in the group all told a different story on the same theme, and they wove the stories together. And we walked out of that. It was like, yes, that that is the way we want to proceed. So then we started doing stories on themes. Um, we did a story uh, called Wherever You Land, That's Who You Are. And then the next year from that theme, Wherever You Land, That's Who You Are, we did a story called Cages. And Cages was about the cages we put ourselves in and how we could break out of those cages. And we used song and humor and um Again, it was weaving the tales together. It was Every one of us had a different story, but it was all in this theme of cages. So that's how we ended up working on themes. It was our last performance. Um, we're really, really lucky that we have two, you know, it was the 70s. It was nobody, we didn't, nobody trusted media, you know, we didn't. We didn't, like, want to be interviewed. We did get an offer to be filmed by Channel 13, in New York, and it was such a hullabaloo, but we did it, and it had good consequences and bad consequences. The good consequence was that we had this footage, and somehow somebody in the troop pulled it together to film our last performance of Cages. So with those two filmed, because we wrote nothing down, not nothing at all. There is no 
uh, there's no archival, you know, writing of what we did. Um, with those two uh, videos, I was able to make the film, It's a Right to Be Women Theater, with, and it starts off with the Channel 13, and it ends with cages, and and one can see how we grew and how we changed and the kinds of what we went through to get from the beginning to what we saw as the end. Thank you, Sue. Um, Sandra and Roberta, would you like to talk about some of the themes uh, and, and subjects you tackled with Lindsay yes. Experimental? Uh, I'd like to talk about um, the fact that one day I was walking along the street and I thought, every woman is a daughter. And it was like the most startling insight. I'd never heard it before. I bet no one had thought it before. I had no idea what it meant. What were the rules? What did you have to do? What should you never do? We started thinking about that. And we began to look in the domestic arena at the family as the place women were basically kept. And um, I came up with an exercise called the matrilineage, where you would name yourself, who you were the daughter of, who she was the daughter of, and go back as far as you can. And it became an enormous research tool and sort of founding thing for the daughter cycle work. Uh, we did at the first women's studies conference in Lawrence, Kansas, we did a major lineage with the audience. And we went around in a circle, every woman naming her major line as far back as she could. Over 100 women. It took a long time. Everyone stayed. It was phenomenal. And some people only knew the people in their major line by the role. I am Sandra, daughter of mother, mama, daughter of grandma. Daughter, they were beside themselves, crying that they did not know even the names of the women in their line. Other people would want to go again because they had just remembered the la another one in their line. And it became a really good tool and a way of us to, we were, we were centering women in our work. And the fact that every woman is a daughter uh, really led to some provocative thinking. And we were part of a lot of women then at that very moment that began thinking about those issues and we're having conversations with other feminist thinkers in New York about those issues. Uh, so the daughter cycle looks at the relationships between women in the family, what the possibilities are for women in the family, what the what is absolutely forbidden to women, what is taboo, what is required, all the rules, and it became very interesting, and we wanted to uh, follow it further with other women besides our acting company and besides this huge audience of women in, in Lawrence, Kansas, and we, which we'll talk about in the next section where we talk about the research forms that we developed. I um, want to, I just want to, uh, I'd like you to go further, but I just want to mention that one of the questions how did we work? One of the questions we asked ourselves was, uh, what is a universal? You know, if you look at, you read Beckett, we all know Beckett writes about universals. Uh, death, you know, father, son, these are universal issues. And when Sandra came into the workshop with I'm Sandra, da daughter of Lil, and we are all born of women. Now, I know we're currently in an era where there's some discussion of that, but <laughs> it was a mind-blowing realization that no matter what your relationship was to that woman who birthed you, whether you knew her or not, whether you, you know, wherever you were on the globe, every human being was born from a woman's body, and every woman was a daughter. So, you know, when I hear um, Martha talk about the professor who said, you have a small mind, 
we were aching to think about big things out loud right. and with the public. Right. And the, the, this reality, this very simple fact, was so important to us because it was clear that it was a universal. You didn't have to have anything else in common with the woman 50,000 miles away than that you each, you did have in common that you were a daughter of a woman. So, you know, the, the, the need to sort of rip apart uh, the, the knowns like what what are our you know you know do women generate you do, are we enough a part of humanity that we generate universals that we generate the things that everyone in the audience can relate to or most can relate to and in some way i think that was a journey that we were on um and we looked at all the women in the family daughters mothers sisters and so forth and um, we tackled after that the story of Electra. And we looked at the historical, we thought we would just do one of the Electras that already existed. We read all the plays and felt this is impossible, absolutely impossible. She disappears from the story so early. This <laughs> is really ridiculous. So we began trying to excavate the old story, the words we had been given and look at what each woman in the play experienced as mothers, daughters, and sisters. Murder, rape, all kinds of violence, the passing on, even though you know you should not pass it on, the role of daughter and the rules that you have to follow. And that was a very enlightening experience for our audiences too. We got a lot of audience response to those plays. We also, in an, another set of plays, looked at woman's relationship to food as a paradigm for her relationships, what's possible for her in the world, feast or famine, and um, survival, feeding others, nurturance, etc. Do you want to say more? Yeah, I just want to go back to thematically, um, uh, in the daughter cycle, it moved. We moved to three plays: daughters. Then we looked at what's the relationship between sisters, sister, sister, and we looked at that, that the, the dynamics of that. We finally, when we got to Electra, we just we, we actually had put off Electra. It was too hard to do, and then we we got to Electra, and Sandra and Claire and I took a little weekend retreat with one another, and we read, as Sandra said, we read, we divided up the Greek tragedies, we read them, we were bored as could be, but more than anything, we noticed that Electra disappears from the story. And I think it was our first really big delving into a deconstruction of a critical myth. Oedipus, Electra, Electra's in love with her father, she wants, she encourages her brother to kill her mother in retribution for, you know, we wanted to pull it apart. Did we, did we think all of that was really Electra's story? And we really found that it wasn't. Um, and one of the things, two things that were threads through Electra, one was a kind of, um, a state of mind that many women are familiar with, which is a state of obsession. And we, we experience Electra speaking and trying to speak. That's the issue of silence. And she rips herself away from the family by the end of the play. You see her in this picture pulling herself literally one foot you know, lugging each part of her body out of the door, the two uh, Greek pi pillars, the Greek pillars, the traditional family setting. And she says, I am not my father. I did not kill people. I am not my mother. I did not, you know, 
I am not my brother. I did not kill my mother. I am myself. And she literally rips herself away from the family to selfhood. Um, I think in a lecture, we really tackled the whole ball. <laughs> and I appreciated what Martha was saying about some of the themes of Foot of the Mountain, because we also took seriously, we were a feminist theater producing a play that was also an anti-war play. <laughs> you know, it, it was about violence, the melding of domestic and global violence, what role does women woman have in that? In you know, and something that we noticed that appeared nowhere in the Greek tragedy was Electra's sister had been murdered by her father to make the winds blow for war. What did Electra feel about that? Her father murdered her sister. Her mother condoned it. Or let it happen. Or let it happen. Did not do anything to get in its way. So, I mean, what, what I, I, I we were, we, we sort of were trying to look at the whole myth from really deeply from a women's perspective. Um, and, and myth is something that Caravan tackled, especially in How to Make a Woman. Bobby, would you like to talk to us a little bit about that? You're muted, Bobby. Sorry. We looked at things differently. I, um, I think the thing that came up with the women's movement is every corner of our lives, language, relationship, you know, became part of what we understood gradually. It got huge. We were part of learning and creating, all of us, you know, to understand the hugeness of women being repressed in the culture. And everybody's talking about that. What we did is... Um, we showed it in a structural way, the socialization. That's really what we were doing. There were men who were the, the world, and they offered these roles to women. You know, they had a dress shop, and, and they were giving women the few choices that they had. And um, we showed in it... Um, the uh, socialization of a girl. She was taught to walk a certain way, talk a certain way, you know, and, and choosing to um, marry a man in a certain way and which man. And then, you know, it, I, I feel like we were dealing with the structure of society. And this photo is really one of the men making this woman smile, you know, and that was what this picture was. She's an older woman, and um, that's it. He's setting her up as a mannequin in the shop. Mm. So, um, yeah. you know, uh, and, and it was really about marriage. It, and the uh, one of the women, it goes, each, each of the two women go through a relationship with a man uh, or men, and that's really what the play is about. And the rape that takes place in the play is in the bedroom. It's mm. not by outside people. It's by her husband. This is a different play. You, um, this is a different photo, but that's okay. You can leave that photo on, Chris. Um, these, um, the woman on the right is wearing one of the costumes that they're selling at the shop. They always had a, a costume. And the uh, woman sitting up in the chair, uh, Eileen, is wearing the what we call the big mama dress. She, and each woman is forced into the socialization that is required 
based on who the man was and how she fits into that. And that's really what the play was about. And I'd like to later show the film clip. Uh, and our relationship with the audience was we did the play for over five years. And, it, we, and, and people like you, same as you, people came back and saw the play and they came back again and again and they showed us their diaries where they wrote about it. I mean, I'm sure you had all of these. They had aha experiences. We were all part of that era of aha experiences. And um, I, I can't remember where I'm going. But, oh, yeah, we had... I think the way we related to the audience was following the play, we had discussions and they were consciousness raising groups. Some were, they were with men and with women. The actors led them, myself and Stan, uh, who wrote the play. The play was written by a man. Our group was very male and female. The men were learning about where they were pushed and how it how it hurt them and the women were you know so our consciousness raising groups were very big and very long and people had a chance to talk about themselves and uh they went on and on and um it led to other people who came to the group forming consciousness raising groups and coming back and leading consciousness raising groups at the theater. And that was basically what we did. And there was an audience for it. So we kept running it. We'd do our play and then come back. Here's Tell Me a Riddle, which I think you know is Tilly Olson's work. This came after that. We did several works of adapting her work, which was much more of an intimate look at a woman's life on a different level whereas our early work was much more structural, you know. So I, um, that's it. That's what I want to say. Great. Can I say something, Sarah? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I just loved listening to Sandra and um, Roberta talk about creating their daughter cycle, which somehow I saw pieces of. Did you have an early video of it or what? I don't know why. I didn't see it in person. I was out in Minneapolis. I don't know. <laughs> Somehow, magically, I saw pieces of it, and I was just, wow, this is so special. This is so magnificent. Um, but I'm interested because I realized, listening to you, that what we did in a lot of our work was to move it out into, with, with little inserts and images, hmm. move it out into a wider a wider thing, like in Ashes, Ashes, we had scenes about the Holocaust. We had scenes about the... Um, yeah, I mean, just different scenes, different scenes about Hiroshima, and, and, and even Paracelsus was in it, uh, going back to the original understanding of nuclear power. And um, Helen Caldicott, which, of course, in it, you know, anyway. Um, but I just, it just struck me as so interesting, these different, uh, listening to all of you, uh, these little different approaches, the, you know, the, and 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 yet we're all doing the same thing. We're all saying we want to get women's knowledge and women's feelings, and we you know we want to break the silence and tell our stories and tell them in whatever form we can. And uh, it's just interesting to me listening to the different approaches to the work and what you know. And and yet it was all wonderful work, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and now I'd love to talk about process and how you made the work. Oh, well, that was a big and, subject. And what, what forms did you use? What forms did you find insufficient? And you had to create, you know, to create new forms to tell new stories. Um, and uh, Sandra and Roberta, would you start this question for us? Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to throw in, I would so love to see everybody's work. <laughs> I have not seen your work for the most part. And uh, Martha and Bobby, I have not seen at all. I hope we can talk after this and figure out a way for us to go further. Go ahead, Roberta, sorry. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I'm taking away from the, the, the discussion thus far amongst all the 
we were all, and I think this speaks to the process, we were not just making theater, and we were not just doing personal or group therapy. We were fighting for our lives and the lives of other women. And it wasn't a sometimes thing. It, it, this was really the heart of what was going on for us for many, 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 many years. And I'm saying this hoping that people, some of the people who are listening are a lot younger than us. <laughs> and it's, the theater is about, at change. its best, about change, about your change and the change within the audience. And, and also that it's not just a career. <laughs> I guess that's what I want to say. It's not a career. It's a life. So, okay, processes and what worked and what didn't work. Um, I will say that um, we drew a lot to start with on a lot of known forms of improvisation. Um, a lot of folks think of organizations like the Open Theater and the Performance Group as um, uh, sort of a seminal in terms of improvisational um, forms, but I want to mention the mother of them all, which is Viola Spolin, who created the theater, quote, theater game. But Viola was a, 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 a social worker, really, and created exercises in theater to use with young people to explore their lives. And many of the things that, 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 that I think all of the groups use, things like the, the conductor exercise, where everyone in the ensemble is behaving, someone is the conductor, and the, that conductor, it keeps changing. But it's not by assignment, it's felt. And the way you build certain kinds of interactions in an ensemble. A lot of, I, I can't, I, we don't have the time right now, but I urge people to look into who was Viola Spolin and what are the theater exercises. They are fundamental to improvisational work. And Nichols and May would never have existed without Viola Spolin, nor would Second City Chicago. Tribute to a great person who created processes and exercises. Um, our process, I think, was not, in some ways, not like, not unlike others, which is that you start with an idea, there's something that grabs you, there's something that you want to, that you're thinking about, and um, you proceed from there. We did a lot of what I'm going to call field work. Um, we did a fair amount of improvisation within a theater, the theater company, and the company over a 10-year period was always fluid. There were new people and people leaving and coming and going. Um, but we went out to groups of women, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, that we had a theme and we held a workshop and we invited people to come, or we went to schools, we went to social centers, we, we went to a, a conference of, um, survivors of women survivors of the Holocaust. Um, and we would do exercises. The, the simple, elegant one that Sandra used before, the matrilineage, was a, a, a sort of spine of how we collected not collected stories, but experiences, pieces, things that echoed and 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 um, reinforced ideas that we we had. Um, and um, I think that 
sort of at a theoretical level, that was very important to us. We, if we had an idea, if we had an assumption, we wanted it verified or denied by other women. And, but we didn't do that with what we normally think of as audience participation. When we moved to the um, Women's Body and Other Natural Resources, the first play, Food, was actually a construction of, I think, six or seven segments, most of which included very full audience participation. Um, Sandra, maybe you could talk about what some of those, like the talk, fast talk. Or yeah, I will. I want to first just want to, Oh, sorry, Sandra. I, I just want to um, give us a little heads up. So it's 8.12, and we okay. do have video clips we, we would like to show, if possible, before we go into Q&A. We've got tons of questions in the queue, um, okay. some from many of your friends. So just in the interest of time, apologies for that. Um, I, I know we do have a, a video from Bobby. Would you like to preface that, Bobby, so we can show it? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. Um, okay. We use, by the way, a lot of improvisation with the company and mo movement work, as you all have alluded to. But this particular clip is, um, ooh, telephone. Um, this particular clip we called the Big Mama scene. And the women in the play go through different relationships. And this is the relationship uh, with a man who understands. That was what this particular piece. He understands she has her own life. She can work. Her work is important and so forth. But this is what happens in the relationship. And she's given a choice. It starts out with he won't take out the garbage. And that's, you know... Or, you know, or he'll only take out his garbage. Anyway, uh, you'll see. Um, let's see the clip. Okay, Chris? The actress is Eileen Paul Singer, and Joe Volpe is the husband. Chris, I'm not sure if you heard that, but could you roll the video for us, please, sir? Oh, here comes the video. She's offered this dress. Oh, Chris, it's not showing. Okay, so she lands up not accepting any of the roles that are offered her. And she runs out of the shop. I don't know. Thank you, Bobby. Um, I know, Sue, you have a clip of the documentary as well. Um, right, this is the trailer. And so just, just roll it. Not much needs to be said. There was tremendous response showing it to my daughter. And she said, um, Mom, some of those things go without saying. 
And I said, not at that time, they didn't. We were counterculture. That was around before the women's movement. Anything that existed was bad in the culture, in the government. It was bad. We had to throw it out and start all over again. That's what revolution is, radical revolution. We knew about that. The idea that we brought into it is the personal is political. We're going to look at our own lives and make a, a women's movement out of it. When we made the film with Channel 13, at the end of the making of the film, they came and showed it to us. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for where is the gay part, the coming out part. And it never came, and it wasn't there. And I was furious. They just took it in their own hands to cut out anything, any reference to, to being gay or lesbian. Just gone. What you saw was um, the the color video is from the Channel 13 filming, and the black and white video was the filming we did of Cages. And you can see we did a lot of music, um, audience participation, and um, uh, humor. Uh, so it gives you a little bit of a sense of what we were doing. So we, you know, started in 1970, first performance, 71, last performance, 75. So shows the growth of, of the different ways we moved. Did people see a video? I didn't see a video of either. Yes, yes, it was on. We, well, you'll, we'll see it when we send you the tape, Martha. Okay. We'll, we'll all get to see it. It's just a technical thing. Um, so I have pages of questions that I um, could selfishly ask these fabulous women, but I do want to turn to some of our audience questions, and we've had a number of people uh, who want to know about the uh, the issue of diversity and um, what did the troops look like in terms of diversity being um, people of color, uh, LGBTQ individuals, other forms of ability and diversity, and what, if anything, did you do to include uh, or center the voices um, of non-white women uh, in your productions, if any of you would like to take that. You know, we were, we were the women who knew each other. We were, we were not uh, acknowledging diversity, I think, uh, in some ways. We were, um, we did acknowledge women in other cultures through our crankies. We, um, once we formed the 11 of us, we did not reach out to other women. We did not want to open the group up. Um, we stayed who we were, and um, it's it's who we were, and it's true. We were a white troop um, at that time. At that time, I think Caravan Theater was later on in the um, moving more to 74, 75, we did several plays about women loving men, women, men loving men. But basically, we that part of the theater became feminist oriented. Earlier on, we had an interracial group and created plays, but not once we got into the feminist bang. You know, but we also played with gender roles: women playing men's roles, men playing women's roles. And it worked very well, the exception and the rule. Martha did, we did too. We had a woman playing the male roles and so forth. 
Um, but we early on, right, we were very feminist oriented. The personal was political. The political was personal. And we did not try to expand that. Um, I'd like to say that I think, you know, we have to recognize a historical period. And um, most of the women's theaters that I know of from the period of, say, the 70s to the 80s were largely um, white women. Um, there were, you know, um, there was some diversity, but it was, um, it was, it was, it was an early stage of consciousness around that issue. Yeah. Um, at the Women's Experimental Theater, uh, the founders were all lesbians, and um, myself, Sandra, and Claire Koss. Um, the and white. And white. Um, the company was, as I said, a, a moving company over the course of 10 years. And in the course of that time, there were um, primarily, there was there were the, the two, aside from Sandra, the, the two critical performers, Mary Lum was an Asian woman who really was with, with the company almost the whole time. Mary Lyon was an Irish-American woman. And I say that because she, she leaned heavily on that background in her work. Um, there were in the in the food series the the uh, women's body and uh, and other natural resources. Linda Powell was an African American woman who worked uh, and through Dennis. and Sharon. What Sharon? Sharon Dennis. Sharon Dennis. So there was some um, racial diversity in the women's experimental theater, but it wasn't a commitment. It wasn't. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is it. It was who came to us, who we met with, who, who, you know, um, was drawn to the work um, and drawn to working with us. I'd like to add in that mm -hmm. as we did our research, we reached out to lots of kinds of organizations where we spoke and worked with very diverse audiences, from people in women's prisons to gay rights groups to uh, the Holocaust survivors to I'm trying to think of what some of the others were classrooms that were from every kind of school. So we had input and confirmation of what we were thinking or challenges to what we were thinking by women across all kinds of all kinds of diversities. But they were not in really in the acting company at that time. There, there are two, two other quick points I'd like to make. One is that um, the fluidity of, of gender roles was critical in our work. So that, you know, every, every actor could play uh, both male and female with almost kind of a sliding scale of moving in and out um, and, and challenging gender roles, which is, I think, um, the, uh, the current generation is inheriting, um, you know, or standing on the shoulders of some of the work that was done in the 70s and 80s around gender. And um, we explored that a lot within, within our, our, our work. Um, um, yeah, I think that's it. Martha, did you want to say something about that and at the foot of the mountain? Yeah, we um, we reached out and tried to interest people of other colors. We were a white company, pretty much. We had a couple of black people on the staff and one in the acting company. But for the most part, we were white, and um, we reached out. It did not a lot of avail, and so we really tried to study why was that true that they weren't coming to audition and stuff, and we held whiteness supremacist group like they have now um, and really talked about that among the white people and how we held, where do we hold our prejudice and what could we do about it. And um, But it, was, it wasn't until the mid-'80s when I had done a play, I had cre helped to create a play with a company called How to Make a... Um, a story of a mother it was called and it was about mothers and 
daughters, but not in the same more profound way you guys did. Um, but um, it, it, in the eighties, we decided to do that play again with a multicultural cast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and went to New York and cast it there because we couldn't get the people here in, in Minneapolis to sign up for it. But um, so we had ended up with a Korean woman, a Latin woman, a um, black woman, a Native American, and a working class white woman. And the five of us put together, we were supposed to repeat the story of a mother, but of course, you know, one and a half days into the rehearsal period, it's perfectly obvious that the story of a mother was a, white, primarily middle-class story about mothers and their cho- and daughters. So um, we uh, we started from scratch and got them each to tell their stories, and I went off for a week and tried to put them together into a play. It was very quick. We only had a, we had about a six-week rehearsal story period, which felt very short, and um, brought it back. And it was so interesting. I mean, the really fascinating thing about this is it really worked which was the big surprise, certainly to me. Um, and it went up and people adored it because they thought they were watching the Rainbow Coalition come to life. <laughs> but the cast themselves got into horrible racist dialogues. The black woman hated that the native woman wanted to work on her own time, which meant sometimes she'd be late to rehearsal and that's how that worked. They weren't pressured by time in her culture. She didn't want to work with that. I mean, that was just an example of the kind of eh, that went on. And by the time we opened the show, there was this, we had a small dressing room for everybody and they would, you know, they, they, they just were at each other and people would come up to me afterwards and say, Oh, that was so lovely to see how they worked together. And we were watching the rainbow collision. Can I go back to the dressing room and thank them? And I'd say, sure, but watch out for the flying shoes. <laughs> um, um, anyway, yeah, we really we were very interested in the issue and tried very hard to work with it. And you know, it became obvious, I guess, to everybody that you need to put people in administrative positions that were people of color. And um, this is uh, a serious issue, and we are going to tackle this again in the second and third panel well, in this series, even more so which Jessica is going to talk about in just a second. But I want to thank you all for a fabulous conversation. It, it was uh, the highlight of my semester for sure. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to E. Cornell and all of our sponsors and to our audience um, who joined us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, Sarah. You. And the thank, rest of you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, this panel will, will be archived on feministtheater.com. Um, and our next panel, uh, which is Theater in the Third Wave, will take place on Tuesday, October 12th, the same time, um, 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And that panel will feature Deb Margolin, Carmelita Tropicana, Marga Gomez, and Mo Angelos of um, the Five Lesbian Brothers. And it will be moderated by Elisa Solomon of Columbia University. So we hope to see you there. Thank you so much. <laughs>